When I was about six years old, I walked into my great grandma now's living room as she watched the very end of It Night One from the original ABC miniseries. I said, what is this? And my grandma, who was still to this day one of the biggest horror fans I ever knew, rest in peace, said, this is the end of part one. They're gonna play part one and part two tomorrow night. We'll watch it together. And I could see on her face how happy she was that she was gonna show me this. The image of the blood reading it stuck in my brain all night until we watched the entire miniseries the next night. It was honestly one of the greatest experiences of my life. I knew right then that I loved Stephen King. After that, we would go to the video store every weekend and rent a few King movies at a time. Aside from its few TV miniseries, I've seen pretty much all of his film adaptations at least once, but the ones that I became obsessed with were Stand By Me, Pet Cemetery 1 and 2, yes, part 2, Cat's Eye, The Shining, and Silver Bullet. I'd watch these movies on repeat on my VHS copies. Then a few years later, director Lawrence Kasdan adapted Dreamcatcher into a film, and I watched it in theaters with my Uncle Paul. After that, I started reading his books. I read Carrie, Dreamcatcher, Pet Cemetery, It, and even Gerald's Game. But that last one is a whole other story. As I grew up into a teenager and adult, I kept watching his movies and reading his books like The Shawshank Redemption, The Mist, Firestarter, The Green Mile, 1408, etc. And I loved them all, but it wasn't the same as the others. I kept chasing that high I got with It and Silver Bullet and Stand By Me. And even though I absolutely love and respect The Mist and 1408, there was something missing, and it was my childhood. Then as an adult, Hollywood remade the It miniseries into two movies, Chapter 1 and Chapter 2. Everyone, including myself, absolutely loved Chapter 1. I watched it three times in theaters. But also like Night 2 of the miniseries, most people were disappointed with Chapter 2. As much love as the first half gets, most people feel like they dropped the ball with the adult section of the story. When I first watched Chapter 2 in theaters, I enjoyed it more than most people, but after re-watching it, I see the flaws more and more. Let's be honest, both the miniseries and movies have their flaws, but everyone always picks on the parts where they're adults, but puts the first half on a pedestal. I didn't like the ending. And I think that's because the IT miniseries came out in 1990. I was born in 1992, so everyone I personally knew watched it as a child and has that nostalgia with it, but they could also relate to at least one of the losers. In case you forgot, they called themselves the Losers Club. Well, one of their bullies calls them it first, but they embrace it. Listen, there's two kinds of kids. One sees it and is terrified and hates clowns for the rest of their childhood, and the others love and hold that memory as part of growing up. They don't all become horror junkies like me, but I know so many people who grew up with the miniseries who then read the book because they were so obsessed with it. I've bonded with so many random co-workers and classmates through the book and miniseries. It's crazy how so many people read his 1,138 page book. For a kid to sit down and read that much is special and it says something about their character. I even used to have the audiobook on my iPod throughout high school so I could listen to it in the dark while getting high or going to sleep. The story of it in Pennywise has a power that makes kids shut up and sit down for hours to read or watch it. At first look, it's about a clown eating kids, but the real power of the story comes from the Losers Club. At the core, it's about misfit kids who all have their troubles at home, coming together and making their own family. I've always known this, but the other night a lightning bolt went through my head. Why do kids love Stephen King? His movies and novels are violent, scary, and sometimes slightly too sexual in odd places. Aside from maybe our grandparents, most people my age don't know anyone who was a child in the 1950s, so we don't relate to the music or social issues, but everyone relates to being a kid. We all started our life as kids, and then we grew up. And even if you had a traumatic childhood, we always look back at those years with some nostalgia and fond memories. The movies and things we did as a kid will always be special to us. There's so many movies you watch as a kid and thought were terrifying or incredible and you hold that memory close and then you watch the movie as an adult and think, oh my god, this movie wasn't scary at all. Or, this movie isn't very good. Why did I love it so much? And it's because it's one of the first things you ever watched when you were a small child and when you're a kid, everything is just so big and new. You know, most Stephen King movies and books have their greatness, but they also have their flaws, but like a person you love, who doesn't have their flaws? One of his film adaptations that I just watched for the very first time a few years ago is called App Pupil. It's made in 1997 and it's horribly underrated. Personally, I think it's a masterpiece, but this film, unlike it, isn't fun. 
It's about an incredibly intelligent 16 year old in the early 80s discovers that the old man living down the street is a Nazi war criminal who killed maybe hundreds of Jewish prisoners during the Holocaust and is living under a fake identity. But he doesn't turn him in to the police, he blackmails him for the information and stories. And he thinks that he has the power but he gets in over his head because he's just a kid and he's not ready for this information he gets. It keeps him awake at night, he can't stop thinking about it, he wasn't ready for this. This is a very complicated story and the character that the late actor Brad Renfro, rest in peace, plays is Todd Bowden. He's very mysterious. At first, you're not sure if he's a sociopath or just a curious kid who gets in over his head. The more that I rewatch it, I think that he's a sociopath that will grow up to do much more evil things that he's already done in this story. But he does just start out as an innocent teenager who has a morbid fascination of the Holocaust and the war. That's something I think almost every kid can relate with. The first time anyone hears about the Holocaust or serial killers or horribly violent events in history, we can't help but be a little fascinated. Like I said, I grew up a horror junkie and the Holocaust is the ultimate horror story. No movie or book could ever be as evil as the events of the Holocaust. What's the saying? You can't write this stuff. I mean, think about it. People are obsessed with serial killers. I mean, just look at that Jeffrey Dahmer Netflix thing. People are obsessed with this stuff. They are. Stephen King really taps into that morbid curiosity that all kids and teenagers have at some degree. I think people like Stephen King and I have much more obsession with darker stuff and uh, that's why we became writers. It's not evil to think or be fascinated with or write about evil things. That's part of being an artist, understanding and admitting that you have these bad thoughts or feelings but using them in a productive and not hurtful way. Stephen King is a master of creating full-fledged characters. Almost none of his characters are one-dimensional. Even the seemingly stereotypical bullies have their character traits and backstory, if you look close enough. You will stay for one hour after school every day this week. My father will tear my hide. You should have thought of that before you picked on Ben. Just that one sentence how his voice breaks was carefully thought out and talked about between the actor and the director, hinting that his father is abusive and that's why Henry is abusive. They extend on this much further in the 2017 adaptation. Ain't nothing like a little fear to make a paper man crumble. Look at the beginning of It, both versions. Georgie, this incredibly young, innocent, cute little kid is viciously eaten by a clown. That's how the story opens. That's Stephen King telling us kids who are watching or reading, no one is safe in this story. Just because you're a kid doesn't mean you can't die. Everyone dies. In fact, mostly children die in It. Pennywise's entire goal is to scare and eat children. This makes me think of Siskel and Ebert's review on Stephen King's Silver Bullet. Get this scene now. A priest who is a werewolf try to run down in his car a crippled child riding in a souped up specially equipped motorcycle. That's an astonishing scene. Now if I told you everything that is wrong with this movie we wouldn't have any time left for any of the other films on this show. One, the story is not credible. Two, the characters are laughable. Three, the child's ailment is exploited. I understand watching these films for the first time as an adult can seem exploitative or in bad taste, but part of the magic of Stephen King is that he never forgot what it was like being a kid. Just like me, getting scared was a high for him. It's like a roller coaster. It's a fun ride that scares you, then you get off and you go back to your regular life. Putting these full-fledged characters like Marty or the Losers Clubs in legit danger and fear for their lives is showing the younger audience the respect other artists don't show us. He doesn't belittle or patronize his audience and I love that. I had two uncles growing up. One was a film student who showed me everything which made me not fear any movie because I knew it was all fake. My other uncle died of a heart attack when I was four years old. He showed me everyone and anyone can die at any moment. Listen, the sad truth is, the only guarantee in life is death. Not happiness, not love from your parents or peers, not success or joy, just death. I learned that as my great grandma now mourned the death of her son for the rest of her life. Adults don't like telling kids about serial killers, pedophiles, or other children that have died in horrible ways because they're trying to protect them from the evil in the world that they will all eventually learn. And I get it, they want them to stay kids for as long as they can, but kids want to grow up so they can see crazy movies or listen to naughty CDs. It's like that parental advisory sticker that they put on CDs in the 80s to warn parents. That was the stupidest idea ever. That just tells kids, buy this album. Even if it sucks, your parents are going to hate it. 
It's weird, when you're a kid, you feel like you have no options. You're told when to go to school, what to watch, what to wear, when to go to sleep, and all you want to do is be an adult so you can make your own choices. Then when you become an adult with boring responsibilities, you desperately miss the days of just being a kid watching movies all night when you're supposed to be asleep. I was a kid who stayed up all night watching crazy movies on HBO and slept all day at school. Yeah, I got in trouble, but it was worth it. To be fair, I wish I paid more attention in school. But if you do that as an adult and fall asleep at work, you get fired, you can't pay your bills, and you're screwed. All kids have that little punk side to them that want to rebel against teachers and parents who constantly tell us what we can and can't do, or watch, or listen to, and all they do is tell us what to do, and we just want to make our own choices. Honestly, that part is still in me, and it's still in Stephen King at his old age. Like I said, he never forgot what it was like being a kid. Sure, nostalgia plays a huge part in these stories because we discovered them as a kid, so they've been with us our whole life, but he's one of the most successful and respected writers for a reason. He's a great writer who started loving stories as a kid, so he always wants to feed that for other kids. He did it for me, and he's a big reason why I started screenwriting in the summer going into fifth grade. If you know me, you know I have horrible demons, and honestly, I don't know who I would be without art and writing. It keeps me out of trouble and giving in to my horrible vices. I think King would relate to that too. If you know his past, you know that he has demons and he's gotten through them uh, with writing and that's what supported his family financially and us, the audience, emotionally. I doubt Stephen King will ever see this, but I'm going to thank him for all the great stories he gave us that I shared with my grandma Nell and my friends. Watching these movies with my friends and my grandma in middle school or in elementary school was some of the best times of my life. I would pay a million dollars to just go back to that night with seeing it the first time with my grandma now. I'd pay every, every dollar I had to go back to that night. But I also want to thank him because he inspired me to be an artist which makes me a better person. And I know that I'm just one of the millions of kids who watched it and Silver Bullet and got addicted to that rush and thought, this is what I want to do with my life. So you know how YouTube works. If you like this video, hit that like button, subscribe to this channel, and I hope you consider joining my Patreon. I'll put the link in my description. It greatly helps the channel and myself. Thank you for watching.